This is your weekly trip to paradise, Louisiana style, with Gary Rasponi and Don Dubuque. Paradise, Louisiana is presented by Rotolo's Pizzeria. Fresh ingredients, friendly service. That's just the way we Rotolo. Demco, your touchstone energy cooperative. Pro Drive Outboards. Baton Rouge Coca-Cola Bottling Company. Benny's Car Wash and Oil Change. Louisiana Fish Fry Products. And by CCA Louisiana and the CCA Louisiana Star Tournament. Welcome to this week's edition of Paradise, Louisiana. Backhead, Bandron's, Boudin, Cajun Meats, and, and the smell is just unbelievable here. You know, we're getting down to Christmas and stuff. Yeah. They're probably coming out with more stuff. They're going to have turkeys here. They're going to have everything you can imagine for your holiday. Well, if you want to get a little sample of it uh, this Sunday, come on out to our Men Who Cook competition. My brother and I are going to be there, and we're going to be serving some of the signature items from Bergeron's. We're talking about the smoke stuffed with pepper jack cheese chicken bites. We're going to have those in Covington at the Justice Center starting at 4 o'clock Sunday evening. Now, what... What are, how many teams y'all got? I heard There's been about going. 17. There's going to be 16 losers and then us. Oh, oh you, 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 you going to be part well, of sure. it? Sure. You ain't going to be no home cooking? Oh, no, look, yeah. we, we, there's no doubt about it. We, but, we, we're going to have the best. Don, I ain't going to go any further than much. <laughs> you got your, your Houston Astros hat. Both you and I stayed up later than what we normally do. Mm -hmm. Way late. It's unbelievable. Way late. The LSU boy Bergman came through. I'm so proud excited. of that boy. You're going to be watching this on Wednesday. It might be decided by the end, but let me tell you what. Best World Series game I've ever watched. Longest, too. Definitely. So, uh, you, Good you, luck to the Houston Astros, and like you said, it may be over by the you time you're watching. You want to make a prediction. It. it ain't over yet, though. I'm not going to make a prediction on this one. It's too wild. All right. Let's hey, by the way, we got to welcome a new person into the family here, Oh, huh? man, I tell you what. I, I, new great-grandson. That's my third great-grandson. And I got one granddaughter a few months back, but my granddaughter, Brianna, and her husband, PJ, Wren Allen Passman, 10 pounds, 11 ounces. He's a big boy. 22 inches long. The woman's hospital will bring them through, and they all get ready to uh, go He'll home. be in the duck blind before you know it. I'll tell you what, I hope he is. <laughs> I, I hope I'm around. Johnny. You know, people have been watching our show for the last couple of months. You see pods on there. Pods is one of the things right now, most people are looking at them at the floods. Thanks to Mike Bro, who is a friend out there in Central. Mike and him have come on as our sponsor. If you want to know more about Mike Bro, Mike Bro is a true outdoorsman, a true family man. He hunts, he fishes. And you know what's the most common thing people use these pods for when there ain't no floods? It's hunt camps. People store four-wheelers and do everything with them. They put all their hunting equipment, they bring it to the camp during hunting season, and they send it back. They deliver it, everything is fine. And, and Mike, I want to thank you, but you can be looking forward for the next, the next few months. We're going to be seeing Mike on a hunting trip, fishing trip, and his kids. His kids, he takes his kids on all these fishing trips and outdoor trips. And I want to thank you again, Mike. So if you're looking for some little extra storage, don't forget about the pod. And Don, we got a lot of stuff coming up this week. You got your camo on. Larry Reynolds is coming in, the waterfowl study leader. It's time for our annual Get Ready for Waterfowl show. I'm ready, but you know our good buddy over there, he got some more gifts coming, he told me. That's how, so, you know, if I'm plagiarizing him, I'm trying to do the best I can. I guess you could say I, I like these freebies. Jay Thomas, thank you. At Coastal Performance, every, I'm serious. I went to about five different places. I had five people come up to me, and most of them were women, and wanting to know, where'd you get that? I love that color. I love that material. Look on the screen. You call Jay Thomas and tell him Gary Rosponi and Don Dubuque sent you. Uh, Don, you got a fishing trip, I know. But, Went uh, with uh, Captain Mike Gallo uh, during that period of time before the cold front came in last weekend with the high winds. 
And boy, what a trip we had out there by Martello Castle. Had a couple of regular lady customers of his that came along on the boat, and me with this, I, I wasn't pretty much useless except doing a story. We'll show you how that went. Uh, but we got a, a, a lot of tournament reports in there. The biggest one going right now is the state qualifier. The high school growing, 219 boats, so we're gonna, we're gonna bring you the totals and who the winners. Big weight was 18 pounds, so I'm gonna tell you that again. We also got uh, the inaugural. Now, I, you know, but they sent it the first half, so they called it, they called it anchor management. It was the island marina, and we got some results from that. All right, plus the Berkeley Abu Garcia fishing report, all coming up right here on Paradise, Louisiana. Hey, I'm Mitch Rotolo, owner of Rotolo's Pizzeria. Our pizzas are prepared every day using the freshest ingredients. But Rotolo's has so much more to offer than just delicious pizza. We have an array of healthy salads and tasty wraps, a wide choice of pasta like spaghetti and chicken parmesan, zesty buffalo wings, and our selection of savory calzones. And don't forget to try one of our amazing desserts. Come into any of our local restaurants or check out our entire menu online at rotolos.com. That's just the way we Rotolo. Relationships are everything in life. For me, the most important relationships start with faith, family, and friends. I feel blessed to be married to my high school sweetheart of over 25 years. We were both born and raised in Louisiana, and so were our four children. We're proud to call Louisiana our home. That's why giving back is so important to us, whether it's car seats, bicycles, or helping those in need. At Gordon McKern Injury Attorneys, we feel blessed knowing that we can come to work every day and help our community when they need us the most. Call 800-653-9968. Welcome back to Paradise, Louisiana. Martello Castle, Gary, does that ring a bell when you hear that name? Martello or Marcello? Martello, yeah. Martello yeah, that name Castle. Rings a, rings a big one in Marcello. Was that Carlos's castle out there? No, 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 this was way before Carlos's time. But uh, the Martello Castle is located uh, kind of close to uh, Lake Bourne. Uh, it's accessible pretty easily from Violet. You can get to it from Shell Beach. You can buy you avenues just a hop, skip, and a jump. Uh, we accessed it from Slidell. It's a it's a pretty centrally located place. Uh, it's usually got a lot of good current moving in there, and there's some coastal construction going on with some walls and some deep ledges. It's a place where shrimp and other bait really congregate at certain times. I and fished it last year with. Mm -hmm. With little Anthony, and I'm going to tell you what, we, back we had 30 or 40 or 50 boats in there, and they were all catching fish, and that was that, oh, I think it was close to this time of year. Well, there was at least that many boats in it last week. We went out there with uh, Captain Mike Gallo, Angling Adventures of Louisiana. I went along with a couple of his regular customers, a couple of ladies, Tammy DeVitt and Marla Helveston. They're from Slidell, and they are regular customers of his, and I was impressed about how good fishermen they were. They could read the water. They, could, they knew how to certainly handle the equipment and did their share in putting in, I think we had a total of 89 keeper fish that we kept. And then we also released probably another 50 or 60 fish. It was on from the time we pulled up, from the time we left. Live shrimp for the most part, bounced along the bottom. Uh, Mike did put some plastic on and caught some fish on the plastic. And I believe uh, Marla also caught them on Isn't plastic. Is there a better teacher than my God. I, I don't know if there is. Uh, in, in one of them told me, I think it was uh, Marla said, you know, every time we come out here with Mike, and they've been going with him four or five years, and they just tell him, book us three dates, book us three good dates each year, and it's set. Uh, she says, I learned something new every time we come out He's here. Amazing. And Mike will tell you he learns something new every time he goes out. But Mike is one of those uh, cerebral kind of fishermen. He's thinking all the time, and he wants to know why this was that. And, tries to put together a little bit of philosophy into it, and, and you can really learn a lot from fishing with Mike. Not just where to go at what times of the year, but technique-wise on how to tie knots, how to present the baits, uh, and, and a variety of fishing, too. I mean, it could be deep water He's a at the bridges. He's a of people on that drop shot right now. A drop shot. He fishes the Lake Pontchartrain trestle and the I-10 bridge. He fishes underneath the LNN train bridge in deep water regularly, and he runs to the Biloxi Marsh and fishes that shallow water site fishing for reds. And besides the Chef and uh, Bayou Thomas and Chef Pass and Lake Catherine, all those areas. These trout that we caught were not by any means your mule trout. They were in that, you know, 15-inch range. Every now and then you might catch one 18 inches. 
good fish, good activity, beautiful weather. It was one of the most beautiful days of the year. Then we had that cold front and those north winds that came in. Kind of slowed it down, but then it kind of bounced back a little bit by Sunday afternoon. And I know you got some good reports we'll get to later in that. But let's take you there now, and you can watch some of the action. Tammy, Marla, Mike Gallo, myself, and cameraman Brian Lucas fishing near the Martello Castle. All right, you can always tell when fall fishing's going on. Weather's cooler, number one. Trout are in, and these ladies are on fire. All right, Mike, uh, tell us what's going on out here today. Well, we have a falling tide in the fall, which brings shrimp out of the marsh and into the lakes, and the trout are in their process of moving from the lakes into the marsh. So you find those areas where they're crossing, lots of fish, lots of fishermen. What size fish can you expect to catch, Joe? We've caught them today anywhere from, say, 10 and a half to probably 15. So they're good keeper size fish. Live or artificial? Live has worked better than artificial today, although both of them are working well. They'll stay in this area until our water temperatures will get in the low 50s, and then they'll seek out areas with less current where they don't have to expend so much energy. Second section of the tail from the legs straight through the middle of the back and hide the hook behind the tail. That way when you twitch it, it goes backwards, which is the way a shrimp goes anyway. Good. Mike, do you think Nate had any kind of an impact on the fishing? No, I don't think Nate bothered us at all. Brought in a little saltier water, but the fish don't necessarily pay attention to the salinity when they're not spawning. World Series trout. World Series is here, or the trout here. We have plenty of trout in Lake Bourne. I've been forced to fish along the western shoreline of Lake Bourne because we've predominantly had northwest winds seemingly over the last two weeks. Wouldn't surprise me a bit if there's trout along those bridges. All right. Look at that. Wow. Wow. Lead him in, Tammy. Good job. All right. And not only can you catch trout, Nice red fish. Pod's moving in storage. I need to clean out my study. We'll deliver a container. My brother-in-law's moving in. Maybe he'll help you pack. He's lazy. We can refer some professionals. It's just until he finds work. We can keep things at our storage center for as long as it takes. I am not happy about this. Or you can keep your things on site for quick unloading. Did you say freeloading? I said unloading. I heard freeloading. I'm sure you did. Store on site or let us drive your things to our secure storage center. Pods, moving in storage, solved. You're watching Paradise, Louisiana. about my Tempur-Pedic. Ask me how fast I fall asleep. Why not talk to someone who's sleeping on the most highly recommended bed in America? Ask me about staying asleep. Tempur-Pedic owners are more satisfied than owners of any traditional mattress brand. Ask me how it feels after 10 years. Tempur-Pedic, the most highly recommended bed in America. Ask about Tempur-Pedic at Olin's, where you know you always get the guaranteed low price. Olin's is the only store in Baton Rouge and Lafayette with the full line of Tempur-Pedics. Welcome back to Paradise, Louisiana. And this week we turn the corner into November. And for a lot of us, what that means, get ready for waterfowl season. Our waterfowl study leader, Larry Reynolds, has been good enough to come by and chat with us. Larry, welcome to the show again. Good to have you. Man, thanks very much. Best before time we, of year. Before we start looking ahead to what's going to happen this fall and winter, let's take a look back at the teal season, which is very popular here in Louisiana. How did it go? Not very well. Not very well. Um, in fact, uh, when we flew the aerial survey prior to the, the season starting, we saw lots of teal. Um, but we set the season as late as it could possibly be this year, when, it, when typically we would have set it the weekend before. And so when opening day came on Friday, I got some good reports, but I also got some, some poor reports. And more importantly, 
Um, we had folks out working picking sheds, getting avian flu samples, and it was clear at least across southwest Louisiana and into central Louisiana um, that the harvest was down substantially. And as if that wasn't bad enough news, um, at a couple of picking houses, along with there being a relatively small number of birds being brought in for processing, there was a fairly high proportion of adult females. And adult females are the last to migrate. Mm -hmm. And so we had a suspicion after the first weekend that we might have been late in the migration. Maybe the season got set a little late. Remember that week before? It was unseasonably cool. Right. But we got, we got some other information as well. Um, as, as some of you probably know, uh, Paul Link, the North American Waterfowl Management Plan Coordinator, bans about 3,000 blue-winged teal every spring in the Port Barry area uh, associated with avian flu research. And he's the chairman of the banding committee for the Mississippi Flyway Council. And so he holds the banding permit for the Yorkton Banding Station in Saskatchewan. In the six days that Texas was open, that we were not, there were 81 band recoveries from those two stations alone in Texas. So we know that there were good numbers of blue wings from Saskatchewan um, that, were, that were in the area, if we can call Texas the area, uh -huh. and, and their hunting was very good. So we suspect that maybe given the strange weather patterns, given the way we set the season, maybe we set it a little bit late. Um, we did have What's a, the intention? Is it changing it or you can't change it? You gotta leave it five years or what? Oh no, we can well, change maybe. it every single year, yeah, Gary. Okay. And, and the only reason we changed it this year is because it only cost us one weekend hunting day mm -hmm. uh, to move the season six days later. And I tell you, if there's one thing that I can get majority support for in this state amongst waterfowl hunters, <laughs> it's setting the season and later. And there's not many things you can do that <laughs> on, but that's one that's of them. That's correct. But no, I, I, I'm positive that our, our teal hunting success this year was uh, substantially lower than average. Well, let's move on to goose because this weekend we have the opening of the youth waterfowl in two of our zones and also the statewide opening of goose. What can you tell us about the forecast for geese? Well, it looked really good uh, when, the, when the breeding population data came out. We don't have good breeding population information for geese, but we know uh, based on our banding efforts whether production was good or not, and it looked like production was pretty good this year. Um, now the movement out of the Arctic was slow. Um, birds didn't, uh, didn't move out the way they normally do. In fact, our white-fronted goose survey in southern Saskatchewan in late September uh, showed a pretty strong decline uh, from past years, but everyone is convinced that, that we were just early, that, uh, that it was a late year for the birds to come out of the Arctic. And uh, last week, good bunches of geese moved into Louisiana. Um, we have a white-fronted goose research pro uh, project going on. Uh, Paul Link and the technicians successfully captured the birds uh, they needed to capture. And so I'm looking for a pretty good opener for, uh, for white fronts. I got a great picture from Mur Rouge from Top Gun. It was unbelievable. They were just covering all that. And in, 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 not only the dry fields, but a lot of the water fields. Good deal. Mm -hmm. Where are we on uh, the, the management of the snow goose and the blue goose? You know, we went into this project, what has it been, over a decade now? Yes. On the conservation order. How is that? Is it working? Do we know if it's working? Is it going to be continued or maybe something even more drastic needs to be done? Um, a lot of discussions are going on right now in the goose community, Don, about that. Um, best case scenario, we have, with the conservation order, and possibly uh, reaching habitat limitations, the exponential growth has been stopped. Um, that's best case scenario. If, if we're interpreting the tea leaves Correct. correctly, that's the best we can hope for. Um, the conservation order has become well established in the minds of hunters. Um, it's been well accepted. We've, we've gotten past a lot of the uh, animal rights objections, and so, I don't think the conservation order is going away anytime soon. Um, the conventional wisdom is that more 
aggressive means are necessary if we're going to meet the population goals. Um, but those are extremely unpopular with hunters, with animal rights people. Um, it's difficult for me in my position to see anything more aggressive happening in the foreseeable future. But they future. are still causing damage up in the north. What's really interesting, Gary, is that we're now seeing some of those uh, colonies moving into other habitats. We used to think that it was only the coastal um, tundra type habitats where these birds could reproduce successfully, but they're moving into fresher, uh, different habitats. And so we, the habitat damage they've done to the tundra is unmistakable. But whether they're reaching a food limited or habitat limited population level, um, I, I think is yet to be determined. Well, it's, it's really good sport, and there are a lot of people who are starting to take more advantage of the conservation order hunting when the season ends. Is there a possibility for some type of an expansion or enhancement of conservation order hunting on public lands, or perhaps the state entering into some type of a partnership, much like we do with the Dove program, to where yes. some of these private lands could be opened up to hunters who want to take advantage of it? I, I don't see any of that on the, on the horizon, Don, and one of the reasons is, is that the conservation order comes in fairly late for us. In other words, um, I've received some criticism over the last two years about the expansion of the speckle belly goose season, of the, of the uh, normal goose season into um, later February. Um, because by the time the conservation order comes in, most of the birds have, have moved back north. Mm -hmm. And so uh, hunters that have focused on the conservation order have been highly critical of our decision of expanding the goose season later in the year. I don't really want to expand it earlier in the year, and so we're sort of, we're sort of stuck in a, in a no-win situation. But um, I, I have not focused on uh, expansion of the conservation order or opening public lands, primarily because the opportunity is really not there. The opportunity for goose hunting in this state is on private sure. lands, and by the time the conservation order comes in after the goose season, most of the birds have moved further north. That's goose and teal. We'll be back and talk about the regular duck seasons right after this. You're watching Paradise, Louisiana. Hey y'all, it's Sam Barbera. I'm with the Louisiana Wildlife and Fisheries Foundation. The foundation is a nonprofit that raises funds and provides support for the Louisiana Wildlife and Fisheries Department. We assist with numerous projects like black bear, whooping crane, bald eagle, as well as family, youth, and women's workshops. For all of the information on the foundation, visit LAWFF.org. We need your support to help our wildlife and fisheries. Visit LAWFF.org. Org. Welcome back to Paradise, Louisiana. We're at Bajeron's Boudin, Cajun Meats and Restaurant in Port Allen. Larry Reynolds, our waterfowl study leader, is our guest. And Larry, it's time to talk ducks. Gary came dressed for the occasion. He's in his camo. He's ready to go. I'm ready. Perfect. I'm ready. Perfect. Well, let's start off. You know, we always said there's three major factors in determining how well, good of a duck season we're going to have. Number one, the, the fall flight estimate that's coming down here, the population. Number two, the weather conditions we get to put them down here. And number three, once they arrive, what do they find in order to stay here? How are we looking? 
Um, about average, about average. All of that water we got prior to the teal season um, compromised some of our habitat quality. Places like Catahoula Lake, where we had an excellent uh, stand of, of uh, moist soil vegetation, got overtopped. And so the habitat quality declined substantially. The same thing in the coastal marshes. Um, we, we don't have the, the real good moist soil production that we've had in the past, but the SAV looks pretty good. Not outstanding like it, like it has in some years, um, but we kind of dodged a bullet with, uh, let's see, what was it, Hurricane Nate? Um, that, uh, that, that cost us a little bit of our SAV, especially out at the mouth of the river. Um, but, but otherwise, things are about average. Um, the water levels have come down in the marsh. We're actually looking a little droughty in, uh, in northeast Louisiana. What about the agriculture fields in the southwest? Now, they were flooded tremendously. They were. During the, the, the previous storm you know, that, that hit Houston in, in the southwest. And that, well, I know when I went up there to visit, uh, there was still water on the roads. You know, when we go to make the teal hunt, we had some of the roads that were there. Now, did that water finally get out? Or what, what problems was that going to cause? It, it caused problems with the vegetation that the waterfowl rely on for food. Even in the agricultural fields? Even in the agricultural fields. And so, um, and so we've, got, we've got habitat conditions that are that are probably about average, but the but the water's out. We've got we've got near average water levels right now, and so uh, the habitat conditions in our marshes, especially our coastal marshes, are in better shape now than they were uh, during the teal season. What about your lakes? I know you've made a couple of times down there. You don't ever get to hunt it late in the year because you're so busy. But right. What about how how's your lakes look? Well, it. Again, there's, there's virtually no SAV, submerged aquatic vegetation, um, out there because of the high water and the turbidity that we got in, in August and September. Um, I actually was hunting out there the first uh, weekend of teal season with, with water above my belly. And not so that's not, that's not teal habitat. Those water levels are down now. And so, um, Unfortunately, this time of year, everything's so crazy, I don't get to get out much. I'm gonna get out there Friday, Veterans Day, thanks to the holiday. What, what aquatic vegetation is the most tough fight salt water? Widgeon grass or what? what, what oh, widgeon, what? widgeon grass is, um, is a prime species for, manage, for managing in brackish marshes because it, it, it has a fairly wide range of salt tolerances and, uh, and it can tolerate it can tolerate a dose of, of uh, salt water. Um, unfortunately, in most intermediate marshes and at the mouth of the river, um, what you've got is other species that aren't right. as salt tolerant. Like hydrilla and... Well, hy hydrilla, of course, is an invasive, but right. uh, um, southern naiad, uh, pond weeds like sago pond weed, uh, myriophyllums, those are all very, very fresh submerged aquatic species that don't handle salt water very well. well. Some of the reports I got, the duck potato, the external part, the leaves were burned back, but the potato, the tuber itself is in good shape. So. Yeah, Mike, Mike Wyndham, uh, a, a longtime biologist with wildlife and fisheries that worked uh, at the mouth of the river, um, used to, he used to tell us, calm down guys, those, those tubers get set by yep. mid-October, we'll be fine. And next year, the Delta yeah. duck potato comes up, so he must have been right. So, Well, one thing we can't do anything about and control is the weather. We need a lot of fronts. We need ice and snow up north of here to drive the birds down. But what are some of the highlights? What can we look forward to on this fall flight? Some of the species that did very well doing their nesting and some maybe not so well. The, the, um, the breeding population data was very similar to last year. We've got, uh, we've got a large bee pop. Um, we had an increased number of ponds, but we think that that's a little misleading. Um, my colleagues in June, uh, when we were meeting, talking about uh, changes in hunting regulations, my colleagues in the Dakotas said, I'll quote, we're two weeks from disaster. Because although the, the survey was delayed a couple of days by rainfall, and they probably counted a number of ponds uh, that were on the landscape from that rainfall, those ponds were gone by the time the hens sat on the nest and the broods emerged. And so um, I, I was in Saskatchewan 
uh, a week and a half ago, and there are lots of dried wetlands with lots of cattails around the edge. So you know they dried recently. Um, it's pretty dry up there. So we've got a large breeding population. I expect no better reproduction than we've, uh, than we've had the last couple of years. In the last two years, we've had very low age ratios in our harvest, which suggests poor reproduction. And so I'm looking for the baseline, which is what you're talking about, what we've got in the fall flight to be very similar to what it was last year. Now, looking at the Palmer drought index, it's a little drier north of us than it was last year. And so, of course, we all know how quickly that can change. Remember what happened last year when mm -hmm. the, the deluge right before our season opened. Um, and so habitat conditions are probably similar north of us. And so right now, right now, temperatures are below freezing in the Dakotas. Right now, it looks like there's some cold air moving this way. So I'm really excited about the, about the survey next week. It's not week. coming from the west either, that moves it. It's coming straight, it's coming straight down, yes. Yeah. And so, you know, you never know until you're yeah. out there seeing what's on the landscape, but the baseline appears to be similar to last year. Our habitat conditions right now um, are average uh, relative to long term, but maybe a little better than last year because we're not so flooded, and uh, and we've got some some early cold up north. When are y'all scheduled for another flight? Monday. This Monday. Monday of next week. We'll, so we'll be able to view those online. The results of those surveys. You'll get them out to the media. And if the on. if the weather is good, mm. and the planes. Uh, our sound, you know, that was my problem in September. Let's I'd bring a parachute. Beautiful weather, but I kept limping back to the airport in malfunctioning <laughs> aircraft. Um, but, but if the weather's good and the planes remain sound, uh, Shall we say a prayer for you? We'll get, <laughs> we'll get the survey done on Wednesday. I'll get the report out on Thursday. Best case scenario. And it never goes that way. There's always something that, yeah. that comes up, but, but. The, that's my schedule right now, Don, and right now the 10-day forecast looks favorable for that. Are there any species that jump out there at you that we've got an explosion in or some that we're likely to see very much less of than last year? Uh, no. I think we're, I think we're looking, looking pretty similar to what we've seen the last couple of years, at least with birds on the landscape. You know, gadwall were up a little, green wing teal were down a little, blue wings were up, shovelers were up, mallards were down, pintails, pintails, the, the, that's what really is causing a lot of discussion this year. Because uh, last year we had a bag limit of two after three years of a population decline and our harvest strategy told us we should have only had a bag limit of one so last year we had a bag limit of two when we so supposed to had a bag limit of one and the population increased. Now it only increased 10% and that's not statistically significant, but the population didn't decrease when we had a bag limit of two instead of a bag limit of one. And so because of this lag in setting the regulations, it creates a little confusion, but it really does hammer home a point that you've heard me made make for many years, and that is that our hunting regulations are not a, an important driver of duck populations. And this year, with, the, with what I just said, it, it hammers home a second point, and that is that a bag limit of one or a bag limit of two doesn't mean that much to the pintail population. Right. Our science tells us it doesn't mean that much. But it means a lot to duck hunters. Absolutely. It means a lot to duck hunters. And so that's what the 2012 NAWAMP revision was about, mm -hmm. was giving additional consideration uh, to hunter satisfaction, hunter retention, hunter recruitment. And these are the kinds of issues um, that, that brought that to the forefront. One last thing, hunter participation and interaction with the department, your agency. Certainly we want to remind people about the Rosso Cane if you're cutting rosocaine, using it as a blind material, keep it in the same area. Make sure you clean it out of your boat before you pull out and go somewhere else to prevent the spread of that mealy bug. The other thing, what other suggestions could you make for people that you would like to hear from the public? Some feedback you'd like to get on some things that might be interesting, not only interesting, but informational and useful to you as a manager. I'm, I'm always, 
Don, 80% of my job is in a chair in front of a computer in my office. I'm always happy to hear what people are seeing out on the landscape. That's been your pet peeve. I know since I've been knowing you, you have been everywhere to answer every question. Well, what we can do to encourage people to send it to you. That not enough people do that. Yeah, it's a, um, I, I'm a pessimist by nature. And, and one of the reasons is because only people that are angry and unhappy call and talk <laughs> to me. And so, um, but there are, there are folks out there that I, there are people in different parts of the state that I trust, that I call, that are, they're willing to tell me we're doing okay. Um, this is what we're seeing. These are the habitat conditions. That's extremely valuable to me um, because most of the time I'm in the plane three to five days a month, three months out of the year. It's difficult for me to get to get a handle on things. And how would you prefer to be contacted? Email, Email. telephone? Absolutely. I find you on the Wildlife and Fisheries website contact information? If you Google Larry Reynolds, Louisiana ducks, you will get more than you bargained for. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Larry, thanks so much for coming sure. with us and doing our duck forecast show. We really appreciate it. We'll look forward to the flight information from next week and uh, throughout the season we'll be checking in with you. I appreciate you guys having me on. I want to go hunting with you one time at the end of the year. You I'm, scared of the black cloud? What's that? Are you scared of the black cloud? You know, no. No, 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 no. In fact, you can talk to people. Um, I was in the hall the other day. The Assistant Secretary Patrick Banks said, Hunting with Larry is not always productive, but it's always a lot of fun. I so. <laughs> there you go. Stay with us. We'll be right back with the H&H &H Tournament Report and the Berkeley Abu Garcia Fishing Report here on Paradise, Louisiana. Benny's Car Wash and Oil Change has been keeping cars and trucks in Baton Rouge clean and running smooth for over 50 years. At Benny's, we feature professional car washing, complete detailing, high-tech waxing and buffing, interior cleaning, and tire shine. Benny's, one stop for car maintenance with complete oil and lube services and even state inspections at our express locations. Visit one of our five convenient locations, including our newest store on Greenwell Springs Road. And don't forget to stop by Beef Quick Convenience Store and Fuel Stop. Benny's Car Wash and Oil Change. Drive in dirty, drive out clean. The best part about being a member of a Touchstone Energy Cooperative is that it's your Touchstone Energy Cooperative. That's the power of your co-op membership. Demco, your Touchstone Energy Cooperative. Welcome to the H&H &H Tournament Report. And Gary, let's get to some tournament results and then we'll get to some upcoming tournaments. Well, right now, the big thing was last weekend, the Louisiana Bass Nation High School State Qualifying Tournament out of Dryron's Landing. Uh, thanks to those guys. I, I, I just, you can't believe the cold and windy day. And I said, these poor kids, I had a, I had a great nephew came by the house to get baits and everything, and he was gonna fish his first one for Central High School. And I said, poor baby, I said, you need coach, you need this, because it was blistery and cold. 219 boats showed up, broke all kind of records. Thanks to Gene Hoover and them for sending me all these things in the bush. Number one winner, Conroe Russian and Caden Riley from Central High School. This and this, 18.5 pounds and big fish at a five, seven, six. They sent us a few pictures. I hope they come up good. Hayden Staley and Jacob Long from, from Live Oak High School was second at 14.2. Justin Watts, which you heard his name a lot, and Kobe Beto from Live Oak also had 13.9. Now, if you look at some of these names, you know, I was looking Raleigh's. I remember the Raleigh's used to work at all the boat stores. I'm wondering if these are the same came the long name, you know, all the longs that used to fish in all these tournaments back then and people of my, my age, his, his, the grandpa fishing them. All these people, I'm wondering if they're gonna just stack up or they're coming back. But again, they qualify, they got a lot of qualifiers. We, we got a whole list to show you on the screen, but 
Again, that's the fastest growing. 219 boats from all over the state on a windy day. They catch 8.5 pounds, and they had a bunch of five fish stringers. That was a bluebird day, but you know, somebody told me a long time ago, when you're fishing and you're catching eight smaller fish and the weather turns cold, go back to that same place, the big fish are gonna be feeding. So congratulations to the winners over there, and thank you all again for sending us that report. Uh, Diane, I got the, the inaugural Lake Catherine Island Marina, the inaugural Anchor Management Tournament the Couples Redfish Tournament. Uh, then again, if you're gonna go to Island Marina, their captains are so good about supplying and giving information. And Miss Angie and David Stewart, not only do they fish, they're keeping reports up, they, they, they're just the most hospital people I've ever seen. They hosted this inaugural tournament. They had 50 people signed up but that cold front and the wind, you know how rough it was in Lake mm -hmm. Catherine. And he fishing lakes, a little bit different fishing canals than the spillway. But they had, they only had 20 or so well, that had showed up, 20 of them tried it, and stuck it out. First place was Bo Farb and Angela Farb. And I'll say Farb, I like Brett Farb, huh? They had 15.66. Second was Kevin Watling and Elizabeth Watling with 15.20. Don, we're talking about tournaments coming up, especially in the kayak. Lafayette Kayak Fishing Club, the Turkey Trout, the Throwdown, Sippermore Point State Park, November 19th. It's coming up. That's, that's one of them good ones where you weigh both in trout and, and uh, redfish. So then uh, I, that's all I got. You got one coming up. I tell you, I'm glad they put that 6 a.m. start, you know, because that's allowing for the time change that's coming up because it will right. be daylight by 6 a.m. as soon as we make that time change, and that's not far off. Also, we have the uh, Bayou Coast Kayak Fishing Club. Their second largest tournament of the year is called Fallen Tide. This will be the 12th year they're doing it. It's going to be on Saturday, November the 11th. Uh, it's a slam category where you catch multiple species. They've got kids division, they've got awards for women division, and even a senior division. Go to bckfc.org, you can get signed up and all the details you need. That's it. All right, we'll be right back with the Berkeley Abu Garcia Fishing Report, right here from Bergeron's Boudin Cajun Meats and Restaurant in Port Allen, where you're watching Paradise, Louisiana. Pause moving in storage. We just sold our house. Congratulations. We have two weeks to move. We'll deliver a few containers. Our new home's not ready. No problem. You can store things with us while you're between homes. We might need help. We'll refer trusted packers. We'll be staying at my brother's. Well, that sounds... He has kids of his own. Well... Five of them. Ma'am? Help. Trust us for local and long-distance moving and store at our storage centers. Pods. Moving in storage. Solved. Aggressive, modern, and durable. The latest advancement in spinning has the Revo name on it, and almost a century of fishing expertise in it. No matter where your passion takes you, world-class fishing is only a Revo away. I'm Mitch Rotolo, owner of Rotolo's Pizzeria. Our pizzas are prepared every day using the freshest ingredients. But Rotolo's has so much more to offer than just delicious pizza. We have an array of healthy salads and tasty wraps, a wide choice of pasta like spaghetti and chicken parmesan, zesty buffalo wings, and our selection of savory calzones. And don't forget to try one of our amazing desserts. Come into any of our local restaurants or check out our entire menu online at rotolo's.com. That's just the way we Rotolo. Welcome to the Berkeley Abu Garcia Fishing Report and Gary, saltwater wise, well, until that front came through last weekend, 
what a phenomenal time they had. That's the way Robbie Campo described it at Shell Beach. Everywhere from the dam right there in Hopedale, out to the Long Rocks, the Short Rocks, the Mystico, uh, even the interior portions of the marsh around Stump Lagoon, Peak Lagoon, uh, all of those big bays, all of that was producing good speckled trout fishing. There's plenty of bait over there. Uh, also, we got a report from uh, Hackberry Rod and Gun out west, out by Calcasieu. Uh, their run, their fall run on flounders has started. Uh, Kirk Stansel of Hackberry Rod and Gun told me that uh, there were numbers of trout. They had plenty of trout, no big fish yet, but there's plenty of fish to keep you busy if you're looking for numbers of trout. I got I got some same reports while you had a hack bear mm -hmm. and Big Lake. My brother and them, I told y'all last week, I didn't send, get to send him the picture, but my brother Jerry and Johnny and Johnny's wife, Christy, in two days they were fishing off the light. That, all that salt water moved in, the salinity came up. They've been catching limits or near mm -hmm. limits of trout and redfish under the lights, off the piers, and it was going on all over Big Lake, especially on that, on that northeast side. Uh, their, their top bait was a tsunami, and mm -hmm. they were catching them off of there. Also, uh, the trout run, Captain Phil had them, you know, they got charters, him and his son Kevin. They had some people sending us some pictures from there. They also got on that, that flounder run over there at Big Lake. Now, uh, uh, I'm, the, the Highway 1 corridor going down from Leeville, Golden Meadow, Grand Isle, that has all been good. It seems like the further up north you go, the better it's gotten. They're chasing birds. Birds are swooping down on the bait, the speckled trout underneath, plenty of redfish to go around. They're fishing those on live bait or gulps underneath popping corks. Um, moving around a little bit over towards Ryan Lambert on the, the eastern end of the state down around Buras. Uh, they were catching a lot of trout on topwater baits. They had a good run. Uh, redfish everywhere. He was out there chasing them with a fly a rod and side cast. Too, yeah, man. he said the water was a little dirty and it kind of made it a little bit tough. And, and then when the wind came up, it made it extremely difficult. But all in all, across the coast, saltwater fishing this fall, and looks like the winter's going to be really good. You just got to avoid the fronts. You know, stay away from the fronts. Uh, fish as long as you can while the front is approaching because the barometer is dropping, the fish are turned on. Then give it a couple of days until that front and the wind blows through and get you back out. You better believe I, I've been stuck on the ground with Jack, <laughs> Jack Payne over there at Delacroix. Mm -hmm. You got to watch it. You know what they always say about a west wind, too. Whether it's northwest or west, mm -hmm. they said you might as well stay at home. It's the worst wind you can do it is. over there in Delacro. But uh, going back to talking about the Leeville area, uh, I had a good friend of mine, and by the way, uh, uh, one of the mainstays over there, they had their 50th reunion at Brett Duet's camp in Leeville. Uh, these guys are from, went to LSU and it's from 65 to 67. They all get together. Every year they get together. They had their 50th reunion over there. Uh, they got to fish. These guys are from Cutoff, they're from Homer, New Iberia, Shreveport. He said, and one lonesome guy, you don't know what happened to him. He, he lives in Dripping Springs, Texas. But they got together, they caught a lot of, they cooked, they drank, they had a lot of fun. They caught a lot of trout on a voodoo shrimp and they hammered the reds on live cockahoes from Terry Serenade's bait shop. Mm -hmm. So that's in the Levy area also been getting a butt. You going to Hopedale? Now, we got Billy Novick, Captain Billy Wawiski, and Captain Michael Moo Moo. They were using Campos Live Shrimp. They had a beautiful string of fish they caught over there. And then in Cocodry, I wanted to go, go to Cocodry. Gary Krause fished with his buddies over there, uh, Keith Warner and them, and they, they had 500 trout to keep Hmm. They, in two days, they were catching trout and white trout, so many, but they, they kept just what they can clean. They kept 225. There was four of them fishing two days. Down now, I don't know they caught on the voodoo shrimp, but they were catching on the Berkeley rattle shrimp. So they got a rattle in that shrimp right now, the Berkeley's real popular, and that's what they caught them on. Uh, now, my big report is coming from Island Marina, Miss Angie and David said that David caught him a 13 pound redfish the other day, right after all that storm and all that weekend. But Captain Andy Jones from Wicked Fishing, mm -hmm. he fished in Lake Catherine itself. And getting out of the wind when they can, they caught a tremendous amount of fish, redfish, speckled trout, and a few bass. They're catching up in the canals. 
That's Captain, Captain Andy Jones, another one of them captains over there. Captain Clint DeArmas also came in with a good string of fish, but she said the best one, Captain Justin Bowles, who I fished over there with, with the Cox Sports Television mm -hmm. guys, it, it, it was unbelievable. He'd come up with a limited trout early. And so when that wind was blowing, the way he caught them, I don't know, but that was Sunday after all that front. So he, it, it, it slowed down, that wind slowed mm -hmm. down Sunday a little bit cold. Uh, I got a similar report from Lake Catherine. Uh, Roy Venod, who has now got Venod's marina, he's got some boat slips right there by Fort Pike. By the way, he's got some openings if anybody's looking for a good place to keep a boat close to the Lake Catherine, Lake Pontchartrain, Lake Bourne complex. He's got it. He told me the same thing. Mixed catches, white trout, speckled trout, redfish, and bass, all in the same water. Yeah, and I heard somebody said something, and I, I told somebody said Mike Gallo and them were catching some fish around the Pearl River. So when they're yeah, coming out. Right. And, uh, and the poncho train itself, mm -hmm. uh, Ken Lambert and his brother Harold, they were going out there to fish and they were trying to do it. By the way, I, I don't have a, a good freshwater report except for what those kids caught in the uh -huh. spillway. I still getting reports coming from the spillway, still getting reports coming from Venice. I'm telling you right now, they're still catching fish in Venice. They're fishing it down river, they fishing down around Pasalutra. They fishing down there. They fishing by the on the points and stuff closer to the river. They fishing deep diving baits and they also fishing when they find the grass. They punch it. Now that's if you want to. I'm getting from Bennett. But before we leave, I want to talk. You have anything else on freshwater? That should be it. Uh, offshore, didn't get any offshore reports. A 20, 25 knot winds. There's nobody going out in that. But. I'm assuming that those, the tuna are going to be active still at those shrimp Right boats. before that happened, right, I know, it heard you on the crazy. radio. It went crazy. Yeah, but I'm going to go back to talking in Ponson Train area. Ken Lambert and Harold Lambert, they live out there. They, they both semi-retired. And when I'm telling you what, they go out and find these fish. Ken, one, he hears these reports. He get them from Chaz. He watches all the reports, all these websites. And he went out there to look where the people were catching fish. I tell you, we went to Irish Bayou because we heard there were bass being caught. There's bass being caught in the Intercoastal Canal, off the Intercoastal Canal by Chris Macaluso now. Ken went out there and he's always tinkering with stuff and baits. He taking a matrix shad and any of his other baits right now and he's taking a rivet and he's putting it in the head of this thing. He's running a bait through, he's putting a, a nail weight and that bait does this. If you fish under the light, or wait till we get on the bridges. That bait is going, you can get it down like you got it on a Carolina rig, or if you have it, again, I'm talking about that drop shot, that it's gonna do this. Now Gary's got a, a little drop shot rig here, and I've rigged it up on this drop shot rig with a lemon head. And again, you can see how the line just passes through, it slides up and down. And you just get in here and you, Tuck what I like one. about it, it floats horizontal. You just tuck one of those trebles in there. There it goes, look at there, look at there. Horizontal, yeah. That, that's sweet there. Ken, you, you, you amaze me every time with your ideas. That's it. All right, well, I know you wanted to talk a little bit about Ducks Unlimited Delta Waterfowl Banquets, huh? I, I got a bone to pick. I, I got a pet peeve, well, I'm going to tell you what. Pick that bone. I love them. You ought to take up from You know this aggravates me. We like to give all the news we've been running on the last few weeks. You know, Ducks Unlimited, Louisiana, Baton Rouge Angle Banquet. If you're watching this Wednesday night, you're late. You can't tell. So I hope you're going off of last week's you. November 1st, John and Parker Center. Delta Waterfowl, which is also sponsored by ISC. The name is sponsored for it. Delta Waterfowl, another great organization that we, we belong to. I try to go to as many as I can, no matter where they are around the state. You go to the ones out there in Covington and, and close to your house. I done been them all the way down Pecan Island to, to, the, to the Ducks Unlimited. Delta Waterfowl, same night. I think it's the third time y'all do that. Why y'all do that? Somebody call me and tell me why y'all put them on the same night. It's got to hurt attendance. And it's got to frustrate people like me that like to go to all of them because all of y'all are great and the food is great. It's don't get no spitting contest. 
That's my pet peeve. All right, there you have it from Gary Rasponi. Y'all need to get together and resolve it. Delta Waterfowl, Baton Rouge chapter. You don't want to take a little claim that, right? I don't like the idea of it either because some people like to make both of them, and this does not allow you to do that. So maybe they'll work it out. They'll take your advice. And we'll see you again next week with another edition of Paradise, Louisiana. Paradise, Louisiana is presented... Paradise, Louisiana is presented... Paradise, Louisiana is presented by Rotolo's Pizzeria. Fresh ingredients, friendly service. That's just the way we Rotolo. Demco, your touchstone energy cooperative. Pro Drive Outboards. Baton Rouge Coca-Cola Bottling Company. Benny's Car Wash and Oil Change. Cracker Barrel Convenience Stores. We have more than you expect. Always fresh, never frozen, raising canes. Louisiana Fish Fry Products. And by CCA Louisiana and the CCA Louisiana Star Tournament.